thank you. Thank you so much for that really kind introduction. Thanks so much for that invitation. It's definitely um, an honor to be here. I would like to start uh, my talk today with my most favorite fact about science and, and chemistry in particular, and that's um, the fact that it is actually a very international discipline. So um, what you can see on, on the slide are the, the parts of basically the locations that I worked on and that I was educated in during my own uh, undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral studies. And this is something that um, you guys have probably seen several times already today. And I do have to point out that everybody else that had a slide like this earlier today was much, much smarter to me, uh, than, I, than I am. So everybody had basically like a linear progression. So either from east to west or from west to east. So my journey looked a little different. It actually looked more like this, so definitely a lot more scattered. Um, but that being said, the thing that I probably value the most about chemistry and science is that it's so international. It really brings people together, so meetings like this. It does bring people and scientists from all different countries together, and this is something that I truly valued during my own education, and I really try to incorporate in my own research group. So um, this is something that is truly important to me, and I think it's very fascinating. We should definitely um, keep going on this one. So um, my own um, education actually did uh, start out at the um, Technical University of Munich in Germany. And um, I also worked at the Scripps Research Institute with Casey Nicolau during that time uh, in the area of total synthesis. And then what you can see in, in the middle here, this big molecule is uh, my graduate work actually at the ETH Zürich with Eric Carrera. And um, the story was briefly mentioned when um, when Laura introduced me, so the problem with this entire molecule was that it was actually Mrs. Science. So I literally had no choice in going back to the lab after my PhD th uh, thesis and actually trying to figure out what was wrong with this molecule. But this was the complex molecule that I worked on during my own uh, PhD studies. And then during my postdoctoral studies, I joined the group of Eric Jacobson um, at Harvard to work in the area of asymmetric catalysis. And these two um, research experience really defined uh, my own research program today that I did bring for you somewhat outlined on these slides um, that combine these two core areas of synthesis of complex molecules, but also the interest, deep interest in catalysis and uh, physical organic chemistry, specifically like um, reaction mechanisms. So we're interested in developing new synthetic methods that allow us to rapidly build up new complex molecules, like the ones that you can see in the middle. But then we're also interested in actually using these molecules in the area of biological evaluation. So particularly two main areas, the areas of inflammation and cancer, and another area that we're interested in is the area of tuberculosis. What I do want to share with you um, today is our current research, um, which takes up a big portion of my group in the area of catalysis with envi environmentally benign metals, particularly iron. So we're really interested in designing designing new methods that are simple, that are easy to do, that can be done on scale, that are green, that are mostly or hopefully very efficient and also um, cheap overall. So designing simple things is not always an easy thing. So I did bring you one of my favorite quotes from uh, Steve Jobs and he actually said that simple can actually be very, very difficult to do and sometimes it can be more tough um, than achieving something that is complex. But if you do succeed in it, then you do have a beautiful product like uh, this computer down there, which I think is definitely going to be timeless. I can never imagine that this thing will ever go out of style. And um, as such, a simple process of all can certainly have um, long-lasting effect and long-lasting values. So this is something that we're truly interested in, and we're interested in applying this in the area of iron catalysis. Now, there's a lot of work going on in this area. We already heard earlier on about um, Harry Gray's work, and many, many other excellent scientists contribute to this area, and I just have a highlight, or basically like a summary of uh, current highlights for you on the slide. So first of all, nature is uh, trying to tame the reactivity of iron by designing these P450 enzymes, which these um, heme ligands basically um, help modulating the, the redox activity of these, of these ion centers and then allow us to use them in useful chemical processes. And other excellent chemists like Paul Churik and my friend Chris Oyeda, who's gonna give a talk tomorrow, by the way, if you wanna check it out, have um, designed these redox active ligands that allow um, us to take advantage of these environmentally benign metals and actually also do um, two electron redox chemistry with those. And then other groups like the, the Bentley lab, for example, at Harvard, have uh, been able to take advantage of the single electron transfer chemistry that's inherent to these types of environmentally benign metals and have done beautiful work with those. So these are some of the, the current efforts that are ongoing and the beautiful work that comes out of this. Now, what was interesting to us is whether we can also take advantage of iron 
as an environmentally benign metal in a much, much simpler way. And the idea that we had is can we just use simple iron-based fluorous acids, for example, like iron free chloride, what you do see down here at the bottom right, and actually take advantage of that and use that um, to modulate the, reactivi uh, the reactivity of these, kinds of, of these types of metals. I do have another quote down there for you, which comes from Alois Fürstner, and it's probably also, I, it's a tough competition between a Steve Jobs quote and this quote over here. I do like them both, but he says that basically you can use and take advantage of the um, oxidation state in different types of Lewis acids to modulate their reactivity, and as a result, you can almost think of it um, as a way of tuning the reactivity, like a ligand can help tuning the reactivity um, of a metal overall. And this was something that is truly and very exciting for us. Now, the area that we thought that we could first apply this to is the area of olefin, olefin metathesis. I'm pretty sure that every uh, chemist is familiar in this area uh, where you take two components, two olefin components, and then convert them with either a ruthenium, molybdenum, or a tungsten catalyst to a new olefinic product that you can see down here. Now, for me, as a synthetic organic chemist, I'm very interested in the synthesis of complex molecules. And very often, when you apply this methodology in complex molecule synthesis, you have to um, usually synthesize one of these components, at least one of these olefin components, from carbonyl starting materials. And those carbonyl starting materials are usually converted to your uh, olefin components, components in stoichiometric olefination reactions. You need stoichiometric um, reagents, and those as a result, will also produce stoichiometric amounts of waste, and this is usually a problem, especially when you want to do it on large scale. Now, people have uh, thought about circumventing this process of taking an olefin and a carbonyl directly together to form a new olefinic product, and methods for this do exist. They take advantage, for example, of Schrock's catalyst. It's a molybdenum-based uh, metathesis catalyst developed for olefin olefin metathesis, and this catalyst is able to give you the desired product. However, in those types of processes, this catalyst does actually not function as a catalyst. You're using it as a stoichiometric reagent. So what happens is that this molybdenum-based complex does force the formation of the reaction between an olefin and a carbonyl to form this um, oxymetallocycle over here, and you form a very, very strong metal oxygen bond, and while this oxymetallocycle can break and relieve the desired olefinic product, you also form this very, very strong metal oxygen bond, which is unfortunately unproductive for catalysis, and all efforts so far to reduce the species and close the catalytic cycle have unfortunately failed. Now, nevertheless, this is a very, very important methodology, and what you can see here is a method or as an application um, very recently in 2015 in the synthesis of Hupocene Q. You can see that people do take advantage of this method despite the fact that it is um, stoichiometric in metal, and it is a very useful method to forge these carbon-carbon bonds um, that you can see over here, for example, in 48% yield. Now, we thought that we could contribute to this problem from a very, very different angle, and our idea was taking advantage of this idea that we could use Lewis acids to tame the reactivity, um, and we thought that if we could uh, develop a method that would allow us to directly bring an olefin and a carbonyl component toge together up on activation with a Lewis acid catalyst to form something like an, an activated oxetane, which is also a full membered ring intermediate, but at this time, you're basically not forming the corresponding metal oxygen bond that turned out to be problematic before, then we would have a new way of bringing these two uh, starting materials together, and then if this um, intermediate was still activated by this Lewis acid, the corresponding retro cycloaddition reaction could also take place to liberate the desired olefinic product. Now, every organic chemistry in this room, or any, every, uh, any organic chemist in this room would probably tell me that I'm totally crazy when I'm proposing this. And this is absolutely true, because what organic chemists are being told is that carbonyls and olefins just don't react like that when you treat them either with a Lewis acid or a Bronsted acid. What these two starting materials do is they re either react in a Prince reaction, which is the part that you can see on the A, or they do carbonyl in reactions, which is also not forming these oxetanes. And the only way that you can actually forge the formation of this oxetane intermediate is if you come in and uh, photo excite your carbonyl starting material to the corresponding triplet state, and that can then undergo a paterno buchi reaction to form the desired oxetane products. However, we thought that there was some precedence in the literature that we could take advantage of um, for our initial hypothesis. And this comes from the group of Dan Singleton, which was published in early 2000, and he investigated the mechanism of this carbonyl ene reaction. And what he proposed is that this was, in fact, a stepwise mechanism proceeding by an intermediate carbocation, and these studies were supported by KIE effects. And um, he proposed that this intermediate carbocation then goes on to do the carbonyl ene reaction and result in the corresponding uh, 
alcohol that you can see on the right hand side. Now taking advantage of this idea that we had of basically leveraging the reactivity of different types of Lewis acids, we thought that if we could come in and complex a different type of Lewis acid to this carbonyl uh, starting material, then we could possibly shift the electron density in this Lewis acid base complex to favor the collapse of this carbocation intermediate to form the corresponding, f uh, to form this uh, desired oxetane product that you can see down there highlighted in blue. So this was a relatively simple and basic idea that we had at the very, be uh, at the very beginning of these studies. And we started out um, with a substrate that you can see on, on the top left. We did initial calculations and it turned out that this substrate um, was very good in terms of the initial ring closing and ring opening energy overall. So we designed this substrate and started out to study it. And what you can see on the right hand side labeled as metathesis, this is the product that we wanted to obtain. Now at the beginning this completely failed nothing worked and what we did see is that when we actually used a very very strong acid Lewis acid like aluminum trichloride the only product that we did observe is this hydrochlorinated product in 66 percent yield and we thought okay if it's too strong then let's go to the far far right hand side which is a very very weak Lewis acid in the form of zinc dichloride and again at that point we did see no reactivity however switching again to the more reactive Lewis acids like tin tetrachloride finally gave us some new reactivity and what we observed is this alkylation product in 47% yield. It had been previously observed in the 1970s already by a German group, the Manfred Reitz group, at the MPE, so it had already been reported. However, when we looked into this reaction, we did observe a new spot on the TLC and we isolated it and when we finally characterized it, we did see that this was in fact a desired metathesis product formed in 24% yield and was the initial proof of principle that there's in fact a pathway using uh, tin tetrachloride as the corresponding Lewis acid that does in fact favor the desired formation of these metathesis products. Now we investigated this further and took stronger Lewis acids, again indium trichloride and gallium trichloride you can see here. And the good news is that those gave higher yields of the desired metathesis product, but they did not only give higher yields of the desired metathesis product, it was also now the only product that we observed in the course of this transformation in 27% yield and in 40% yield overall. And when we finally um, turned our attention to iron 3 chloride, we did observe that this was the uh, best Lewis acid overall, resulting in the desired formation of this desired product in 50% uh, yield overall and when we finally optimized this further we could show that uh, that uh, in fact catalytic amounts of iron tetrachloride are even better than stoichiometric amounts in catalyzing this transformation and resulted in quantitative yields of 99 percent of this desired metathesis product and I do want to cut a long story short and just show you quickly on uh, the next two slides what we can do with this type of methodology. Since we first published this initial paper, we did take this in, into different types of new areas, and this is one area that we're really, in, uh, really excited and, and interested about. This is the area of polyaromatic hydrocarbons. You can see that these different types of molecules that you can see here are used in very, very different areas of chemistry. For example, these organic light-emitting diodes and all of these very expensive German cars uh, that you can see over here, but also very other uh, different areas, for example, the liquid crystals or the corresponding thin film organic semiconductors that you can see on the left-hand side. And everything, every bond that I highlighted for you in blue in these um, polyaromatic hydrocarbon structures are bonds that we can use or that we can basically build up using this method that we had developed in a very, very efficient and very inexpensive way. So to briefly highlight and show you some of the things that we can do with this very efficiently is these are the different types of structural motifs that we can access in uh, using this methodology that we have developed. So for example, we can use this uh, three-membered ring aromatic systems over here and then build it up to these four-membered rings and even higher order polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And on top of the slide, you can see my absolute favorite example in this area using uh, a double metathesis approach to build up this, um, this um, dense uh, tetraphene on the right-hand side. Now with this, I probably come also to the most important part of my, uh, my talk. First of all, if you are more interested in, in, in this and if you want to know and learn more about this, we have two talks left at this conference. So the first one is actually from my student, Paul Real, this afternoon. And then I have another talk tomorrow and I'd be happy to show you more about this. But now I do want to thank all of my coworkers, all of my, uh, my students. They're a great, great and fantastic group to work with. I'm really, really proud. And they will never let me forget that they actually now said that in public. But I'm really, really happy and really proud of them, of what they've achieved so far in the funding agencies. And thank you so much for seeing me use for that invitation. <laughs>